Well, you can be seated. Thank you all for being here. What an honor it is to be back at Victory Life. I think I did a Jubilee Forum about five years ago or something like that, and this is my first time back in a long time. And I hope you understand that Victory Life, Pastor Dwayne and Sue and Jacob and Hannah and all of the staff here, you've got one of the best ministry teams in the world. And Mark and Lisa, I have known them for at least 30 years, might be closer to 40 years, and we've been good friends. They were young back then. <laughs> Lisa told me I hadn't grown old at all, and I immediately wanted to pray for her eyes. <laughs> it's not true, but anyway, what an honor it is to be with you. And, uh, you know, hi to all of you that are watching from the other campuses. I often attend the campus in Colorado. Uh, the people that run the campus in um, uh, Germany are friends of mine. They work for us, Jurgen and Brenda. And hi to all of you. And anyway, all of the campuses that are watching in different places, it's a real honor to be with you. And I believe that God will speak to you today. I've got a couple of things out there I'd just like to highlight. I've got a book entitled, Who Told You That You Were Naked? And we have people write in and say, I want that book on how to be naked. That's really not what this book is about. It's a study in the conscience. I believe it was the con God didn't tell them they were naked because he said, who told you you were naked? The devil didn't tell them. They told themselves. Their conscience condemned them, and that's the source of your condemnation. This will really, really help you. And then I've got a book entitled The Power of Imagination, and this has just changed my life. God spoke some things to me in 2002 that literally changed the way I look at everything. And then this is one of the CDs out of our Healing University and that's a huge program that Pastor Dwayne is a part of that. He's one of the teachers, and I think there's seven of us that just took the things that God has shown us on healing and put it into, I think it's something like 48 lessons or something like that. And so I'm going to ask Ashley Paredes, if he would, just to give this stuff away to people that look like you need to learn how to be naked or <laughs> something. Ashley and his wife, they're Brits, and they came over from England. I prayed for their daughter 15 years ago, and she was raised up from her deathbed. And so they've gone through the school. They now have their own ministry, and if I'm not mistaken, Carly's going to be here in a few weeks for the women's conference. His wife will be one of the speakers here. So if you're in this area, or even if, it's, uh, if you have to make a trip for it, it would be worth coming. We, when we were holding our last Healing is Here conference, uh, we had a panel of seven of us up here, and we were just discussing the product and telling people about the benefit it would be to them. And there was a woman that came running to the front, and she had a four-month-old baby that died during the service. And she just put the baby on the stage, ran down and put the baby on the stage. And so Carly, uh, Ashley's wife, she grabbed this baby and just started praying for it. And in a minute or two, this baby just came back to life and was raised from the dead. That's really good for a healing conference. It's awesome. People got excited. Amen. So is uh, Stephen Becky Cunningham here? I've been looking for you. Are you here? They were supposed to be here. Anyway, that's my niece and nephew-in-law, and they run our Oklahoma school, and they were supposed to be bringing a lot of people with them, but maybe they'll make it later. All right, I'm going to share some things with you. I, Pastor Dwayne sent me his teaching on counterculture from a few weeks ago. How many of you heard that? And he said, you're going to like this. And man, I loved it. I've listened to it a number of times. And the Lord has been speaking to me along the same lines. For those of you that don't know, Dwayne and I, it's, a, it's scary nearly how alike we are. And I mean, we've been in ministry for decades without knowing each other. And when we came together, I, I don't know anybody that is, we are as much alike as Dwayne and I. We were even playing golf one time and he was embarrassed because he plays with these yellow green balls and he thought I'd make fun of him. And when we got out there, I play with those. That's what I, <laughs> we just do everything together. It's like we're twins separated at birth. But of course, I was the better looking of the two. And, and uh, 
Dwayne serves on my board. He's a very important part of everything we do at Karis Bible College, and he, he's a super blessing. But anyway, when I heard that, I've been teaching on the fear of the Lord, and that's what I want to talk about. And it will go along with what Dwayne has been teaching. I'll probably, will overlap, but you know, I pastored three little churches, and one of the things that I loved is when somebody came into my church and taught the same message that I was teaching. Because there's always a little different perspective, a little different spin on it. And it would confirm to the people that this isn't just me saying it. You know, this is God because the same thing's being said through somebody else. So even though some of this, I'm sure, will overlap with what Dwayne is going to teach as he comes back and continues to teach on that, I think it'll benefit you. And uh, let me say that, you know, I really respect Dwayne. I love him. And if anything I say goes against him, which I don't think it will, because I've only heard one thing that he ever said that I disagreed with, and I asked him about it, and he says, well, that's not what I meant. So he didn't explain it. So I'm not sure I even disagree with that. But uh, anyway, if anything I say goes against Pastor Dwayne, you stick with your pastor. That's the way you need to do it. But let me just share with you about the fear of the Lord Psalms chapter 36 verse 1 says, The transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. Now we could spend all night on that. I've got actually 17 pages of notes. And I'm not going to preach all of that to you in the next 38 minutes. All right, But we're going to cover as much of it as I can. But we could stay on this all night long. You look at our society today and the things that are going on and the things that are being done, you can try and describe this in a thousand different ways, but the bottom line is they don't fear God. There isn't any fear of God. The transgression of the wicked says within my heart, it may not say this in their heart, but for those that know the Lord and have a proper perspective on things, it shows us that they don't fear the Lord. You know, used to, there was a fear of the Lord in our society that even people that didn't know the Lord knew that He existed. And they knew that they would be giving an account. And that fear of the Lord restrained wickedness. I'm, if I can talk quite quickly enough, I'm going to go through a lot of scriptures that show you the fear of the Lord is to depart from evil and to hate evil and do things like this. And even people that didn't know the Lord had a knowledge of the Lord and a fear and a reverence from the Lord and it restrained society. Today, the fear of the Lord is nearly non-existent, even among Christians. And I know that some people think, oh no, I fear the Lord. But the scripture says the fear of the Lord, the transgression of the wicked says within my heart that there is no fear of God. If you are living an ungodly life, if you're full of hatred and anger and all of these kind of things, you can say what you want to, but you don't fear the Lord or it would cause you to act differently. Here's the definition of fear according to the dictionary. It says a feeling of alarm or disquiet caused by awareness or expectation of danger. That's not the fear of the Lord. That's not what we're talking about. The second one is an instance or manifestation of such a feeling. The next one is a state of dread, concern, solitude. The fourth one says awe, reverence, fear of God. That's what we're talking about. Is not a dread. Not being afraid of the Lord. God is a good God. There's no reason to fear him, especially once you commit your life to him. He is for you and not against you. And we don't fear the Lord in that sense, but we should have an awe or a reverence of God. Here's what it says in Psalms chapter 33, verse 8. It says, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. So it's using the word fear and awe uh, interchangeably here. This is talking about having an awe, a reverence, a respect, honoring the Lord. And look at this in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. Jesus feared God. This is what it says in Isaiah chapter 11. It says, There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. If I had time, I could show you that's a prophecy about Jesus, and Jesus feared the Lord. 
Now, if Jesus feared the Lord, who had no sin, he was God manifest in the flesh, we have to be able to define fearing the Lord not as terror or being afraid, but rather honor, respect. There's so many examples in the scripture of Jesus honoring his Father. Matter of fact, Jesus said himself that if you don't honor the Son, then you have not honored the Father, out of John chapter 6. And so it's talking about an honor, a reverence, for the Lord. And also says that the New Testament church feared the Lord. Acts chapter 9 verse 31. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. So the New Testament church walked in the fear of the Lord. I've had some people say, well, that stuff about fear in the Lord is all Old Testament. We got a new covenant. We don't do that. This is new covenant. They walked in the fear of the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1 says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. And if I had time, we could talk about this more. But you know what? If you aren't living a holy life, you don't fear the Lord. Thank you for that one. That's right. You know, I preach a lot on the grace of God. I know Pastor Dwayne does. And man, we are so thankful that God loves us and that it's not performance-based and that we don't get what we deserve and that God loves us in spite of what we do, not because of what we do. I believe that with all of my heart. But this does not mean that we don't live a holy life. I live a holy life out of fear of God. Not terror, but reverence, awe, respect. You perfect holiness in the fear of the Lord. If you aren't living a holy life, you are not fearing God. Now this isn't preaching that you have to be perfect, never make a mistake. But I mean, if that isn't where you're headed, if that's not the direction that you're going, if you just are sitting there and saying, well, man, God loves me, so I can go out and live however I want to, you don't fear God. And without going into a lot of specifics, our society today, man, they are promoting ungodliness that goes completely against what the Word of God says. And yet many of them would say, well, I'm a Christian, and they may not use this terminology, but I fear the Lord. They don't fear the Lord. Man, there's so many other scriptures. I'm talking as fast as I can trying to get to these. Like I said, I got 17 pages of notes I'm trying to go through. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. This is talking about husbands and wives, if you take it in its context. And you are supposed to submit yourself one to another in the fear of the Lord. If you go down to verse 33, this is Ephesians 5, 33, it says that the husband is supposed to love his wife and the wife is supposed to reverence her husband. The word for reverence right there is the Greek word Phobeo, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but it's a word we get phobia from. It's the word fear. It's used 85 times in the New Testament, and this is the only time in the Scripture that it was translated reverence. But that's exactly what it's describing. A woman is not supposed to fear her husband in the sense of be terrified, but she's supposed to reverence her husband. And we are supposed to reverence the Lord. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be always ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We're supposed to uh, answer people, respond to them, minister the word of God in fear. Again, not a terror, but in a reverence, an honor, a respect for other people and for God. You know, we teach our students... Lots of times when people get up to speak, we, I ministered to our students here in Sherman uh, this morning, and one of them got up and gave a testimony about how that they were just afraid to stand in front of people, and now they're getting bold, and, and they were able to speak. Most people have a fear of people, a fear of standing in front of people that they're going to say something stupid or make a mistake. If you came looking for something to criticize me over, I've got something for you. Hey, man, I... <laughs> I can guarantee you I will make a mistake. I am not the perfect person. And I was so introverted I couldn't even look at a person in the face and talk to them. But you know what changed my life was when God touched me and changed my life so much. I fell in love with him and I fell in love with other people. And I was ministering one time and I mean it was a struggle. 
And I was laboring, trying to minister because I was so afraid of people. And I had a man come up to me and he says, you've got some good things to say. And if you ever got to where you were more concerned about the people you're ministering to rather than yourself, you could be a blessing. And you know what? It was true. And if you are timid and shy in front of people, it's because you're thinking about yourself. You're thinking about what do they think about me. The antidote to that is to get over yourself. And get to where you love other people more than you love yourself. And you're going to tell people the truth because it's the truth that sets them free. And so you do it in fear, reverence for God and reverence for them. We, we sometimes cloak things and say, well, I just am trying to love people. I'm just going to love them. I'm not going to say anything that would offend them. You know, that's not the way this church is. Man, Pastor Dwayne, Jacob, Mark and Lisa, I know that they speak the truth and sometimes it offends people. But you know what? If you truly love them, you are going to tell them the truth and give them the honor of rejecting the word on their own instead of you rejecting it for them. You know, I had a, I had a man that came to me one time and was asking me a question about something. And he asked, what's wrong? Why isn't this working? And God spoke a word to me. And I knew what the answer was. I knew exactly what to tell this guy. But I anticipated he isn't going to like this. He is not going to be blessed by this. He's going to reject it. And I was sitting there and in myself debating, should I tell him everything that the Lord spoke to me or not? And the Lord spoke to me and he says, you don't have the right to reject the truth for him. And if you don't tell him the truth, then you didn't even give him an opportunity to receive. You rejected it for him. And that changed my life. And since that time, man, if God shows me the truth, I'm going to say the truth. And you might reject it and you might reject me, but I'm going to give you the honor of rebelling at God on your own instead of me doing it for you. Amen. Praise God. Fearing God is trusting God. Psalms 115 verse 11 says, Ye that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. Fearing God is trusting God. If you aren't trusting God, if it's hard for you to let go and to feel like, God, I'm just, this is your problem. I'm not going to worry about it. You know, over in 1 Peter it says, Casting all of your care over upon Him because He cares for you. And that's right after the verse that says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. We often take these verses as individual statements and we, we talk about humility and then we go to casting your care on the Lord. But they're really linked. They follow one another. Men are the ones that put the chapter and verse divisions in there. And when it says, humble yourselves, the next phrase says, casting all of your care over upon Him. If you haven't cast your care on the Lord, if you stay up at night worrying, how am I going to bring this to pass? How is this going to work out? You haven't humbled yourself. You still have the weight and the responsibility of, of fixing this thing on your shoulders. When you humble yourself and say, God, I give this to you, you cast your care upon Him, you can sleep at night. You can let it go. And if you aren't trusting in the Lord, if you are still bearing the burden of trying to fix everything on your own, then you don't fear God. Fearing God is trusting God. I know some of you are thinking, no, I do trust God, but I have all these problems. I'm not against you. Amen. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Ye that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. If you don't trust in the Lord, if you are still worried and dealing with these things and wondering how is this going to work out, you haven't feared the Lord. You may be headed in that direction. I'm not condemning you, but you haven't arrived. Because that is not trusting the Lord. So it says, Ye that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The Lord hath been mindful of us. The Lord will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. Don't you want to be blessed? Well, then you need to fear the Lord. You need to reverence the Lord. You need to honor the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. Again, if you are leaning under your own understanding, then you aren't trusting in God. 
I tell you, this is something that it's hard for most people to do, especially those who are like the ten talent person. If you're a person that can just handle things on your own, if you're a person that just, you know, you have a confidence level that you can just do anything, actually that's a, that's a hard thing to overcome because you tend to trust in yourself and your own wisdom, lean under your own understanding. In a way, it's a real blessing to be a one-talent person. Amen. And just not have a lot of anything going for you because it makes you depend upon God. I feel sorry for those of you that have it all figured out. Man, this is great. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. If you don't fear the Lord, you are wise in your own eyes. You are leaning under your own understanding. You're depending upon yourself, and you are not departing from evil. Again, if you are living in sin, if you are living in rebellion, if you know that God has told you to do something and you aren't doing it, and this doesn't only apply to one, breaking one of the big ten, you know, the Ten Commandments. This isn't just about going out and lying and stealing and committing adultery. Those things are sin. But also if the Lord has told you to do something and you aren't doing it because you're fearful that, God, if I do this, people won't understand. What will I do for a living? You know, we have people all of the time that want to come to our Bible college. And they will say, God told me to come, but... And then they'll give me all of these reasons why it won't work. And uh, after 20 minutes of telling me all the reasons that they can't do it, they say, what do you think? And I said, you lost me the moment you said, God told you to do this. If God told you to do it, do it. And there, that's sin if you aren't doing it. Now, God loves you. But it's stupid. It's stupid not to do what God tells you to do. But what I'm trying to say is God loves you, stupid. He's not mad at you. <laughs> He's not mad at you, but you need to get over it. You need to start doing what God told you to do and quit leaning under your own understanding and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of thine increase. Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whosoever putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Man, when you are fearing men... And a lot of people say, well, I don't fear man. Did you know if God wants you to go witness to somebody, talk to them about the Lord, if they're at work talking around the water cooler and they're talking about killing babies and infanticide and they're talking about they can't even figure out which bathroom to go into and stuff like this and you have the truth and yet you won't speak the truth, you can say it any way you want to, you fear men more than you fear God. You honor them. You reverence them. You want their respect, their acceptance, more than you want God's acceptance. Now, Pastor Dwayne, he will be nicer than I am. I'm not a pastor. I travel and minister, and I just drop a bomb and leave, and then, and then Jacob has to come along and fix it, or Mark and Lisa, and so... Come back. If this is your first time here, come back and let them love you and treat you nice. But I'm just telling you that if you won't speak up and speak the truth because you are afraid of how they're going to react, you fear them more than you fear God. And you can whitewash that. You can try and fix it any way you want to. And you say, but no, I'm just trying to love them. The Bible didn't say that love sets a person free. It's the truth that sets a person free. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15 says we're supposed to speak the truth in love. So it's not just truth like a club without love, but it's certainly not love without truth. You have to speak the truth in love. And if you won't stand up and speak the truth, it's because you fear men more than you fear God. The fear of the Lord is to reverence the Lord. Verse 33, Ephesians 5, 33, I've already quoted that. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband. That's that exact same word that was used 87 times in the New Testament translated fear. That's the only time it's translated reverence. Loving the Lord is fearing the Lord. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 6, it says, And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments 
And you put that together with Luke chapter 1 verse 50 that says, And his mercy is on them that fear him. So Exodus 26 says he shows mercy unto thousands of them that love him. And then Luke 1 50, his mercy is on them that fear him. So it's using love and fear interchangeably. If you truly love God, then you are going to fear him. You're going to honor him above anything or anyone else. You know, you will have people sit there and say, well, I just fell in love with this person and that's the reason I committed adultery or, or whatever. You didn't fall in love. You fell in lust. You aren't menaced. You don't care about them. It's all about you. You are satisfying yourself. And if you aren't doing what God told you to do, you can sit there and say, well, I was tempted and all this stuff. No, you were honoring yourself. You didn't honor God. I'm not saying those things because I hate you. I love you. I'm telling you the truth. It's the truth that's going to set you free. Boy, here's some big things. Did you know honoring your parents and honoring others is fearing God? If you don't honor your parents and others, you don't fear God. Leviticus 19.3, You shall fear every man his father and mother, mother and father and keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 19.32, Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head. That's talking about the white head. And honor the face of the old man and fear thy God. I am the Lord. Man, I got white hair. You're supposed to fear me and honor me and reverence me. what the scripture says. <laughs> and did you know in our society today, this goes along with us losing the fear of the Lord. We don't respect authority. There is a rebellion towards authority. You know, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to have to talk quick and just summarize some of these things. But if you go to Colossians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 6, Romans chapter 13 verses 1 through 7 talks about submitting yourself to the ordinances of men and the authority that's placed over you. And it's a command and it says if you don't do those things, you do not fear the Lord. We've got people today that sit there and reject the police and government authorities and criticize them. And there may be somebody right here in this room that's saying, but there's people that they're dishonest and they're crooked. Well, you know, there's pastors that are dishonest and crooked. But does that mean that you should reject the church and reject all pastors because some have done something wrong? There is no doubt that there's police officers, there's people in government who don't do the right thing, but for you to have a rebellious attitude and to criticize them and to come against them, you do not fear God. You know, when Trump was elected, they actually started advocating anarchy. There was people carrying placards about anarchy. Anarchy is of the devil. It is not a godly concept. Anybody who promotes that does not fear God. You don't respect authority. Just because there are some pastors that don't do everything right, does that give you a right to come into church and criticize? And most people would say yes. I don't know how many of you worked in a, in a business where there's multiple people. Like we have 650 employees. And any time you get a bunch of people together, there has to be an authority system, a structure. And we have Christians that do things in our ministry that would never do it in a secular business. In a secular business, you would never criticize a CEO and your manager that's over you. And you would never say those things. You know you'd be fired in a hurry. You may not agree with everything they do, and if it's really something that's sinful, well, then you aren't supposed to obey it, but you don't have the right to go in and start, uh, you know, organizing a mutiny and a revolt against them. If you don't like it, leave. Go get you a different job or something. But in church, those same people that would never do this in the secular realm will come into church and over, uh, you know, on lunch, on Sunday, you'll have roast pastor for lunch. <laughs> And you'll just pick apart everything and criticize this and criticize everything else. And it shows that you don't reverence, you don't honor, you aren't respecting. Again, this doesn't mean that you agree with everything they do. I can guarantee you in our ministry, we don't do everything perfectly. I can understand a person not agreeing with everything that we do, but you don't have the right to come in and try and undercut me and destroy my ministry. Take my money. I'm paying you for working, and yet you come in and criticize me. You do not fear God. 
Amen. I'm preaching better than you're listening. Man, just for time's sake, I'm just going to say this. I'm not going to give you the references, but there, Deuteronomy, Proverbs, other places, if you pay your tithes, it shows that you fear the Lord. And it says that you can teach people to fear the Lord through honoring and giving money. A person that doesn't give is a person that doesn't fear the Lord. You fear the bill collector. You fear all of these other things more than you fear God. You don't reverence and trust God if you aren't a giver, if you aren't a tither. Man, that is so good. I hate to skip over it. But Deuteronomy 14.22, Proverbs 3, 7 through 10. I'm not going to read them. But it's awesome. Not taking advantage of the others is fearing God. It says in Leviticus 19.14, Thou shalt not curse the death deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind. In other words, this is talking about treating other people. A, a deaf person, you talk about them just because they can't hear you, or you could say that you talk about people because they aren't, uh, you know, there at that moment and you're gossiping about them. A person that does that does not fear the Lord. It says, Thou shalt not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shalt fear thy God. I am the Lord. If you talk about a person who can't hear you talking about them, you don't fear God. If you put a stumbling block before a blind person, they're going to fall over that. If you put a trap, if you do something to hurt a person, you don't fear God. People that steal don't fear God. People that take advantage of other people don't fear God. In your business, if you take advantage, if you tell them, oh, this is the best thing, and you, you talk about it and you try and get them to buy it and you know that it's a defective product and you put down the other people. You don't fear God. If you aren't good in your business dealings. Leviticus twenty five seventeen. Ye shall not therefore oppress one another, but thou shalt fear thy God, for I am the Lord your God. Man, that's awesome. If you oppress somebody else, you don't fear God. I hope you're seeing a pattern here. What happened to my time? It left. You better fix that thing because I don't have a clue how long I'm supposed to go. But it went from 18 minutes to zip. I know I didn't talk that long on that. Now what was that? Oh, man. Pastor Mark said I can do what I want to. So 17 pages. <laughs> I can tell when you're through listening, so I won't go past that. Anyway, here's another. There's about four or five scriptures here that talk about like Deuteronomy 6.24. And the Lord commanded us to do all these things, statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always. The Lord wants you to fear Him for your good. Some people are listening to this and thinking, this is terrible, this is restrictive. Man, it is a blessing to fear God. Yeah. You know, we drove all the way here from Colorado, and Ashley tends to go a little bit faster than I do. <laughs> but, and so I was driving, and I'll set my cruise control like two miles over the speed limit so that, you know, if you go up a hill, you don't lose everything. But I go about two miles over the speed limit, Ashley has this app on his phone that tells you there's a cop up ahead and all of this stuff. And he can't drive without that. You know why? He, he fears that he's going to get caught. I don't have to worry about it because I don't speed. There's benefit to fearing the Lord and doing what's right and you can pass a cop without having to put your foot on the brake and stop every time. Now, I must admit, I was talking to Ashley yesterday and we passed a cop. I was doing seven miles an hour over, but it was a mistake. I'm not saying I do this perfectly, but that's what I tend. Anyway, my point is there is a blessing. There is a blessing when you serve the Lord and when you walk with the Lord. You don't have to fear about 
uh-oh, did I say this about this? What did I say about this person? You just, you just don't worry about it because you just fear the Lord. You honor God. You honor other people. And you don't have to constantly be wondering about, am I going to get caught? Is somebody going to find out about this? It's, it's a blessing to fear the Lord. Here's one of the things I was wanting to get to. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 7 says, Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. If you aren't departing from evil, if you are doing things that you know are wrong, then you don't fear the Lord. If people feared the Lord, they would depart from evil. Did you know that when our nation was founded, uh, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson... And there's a number of them I could quote, but they basically said that if the people ever quit fearing the Lord, they would use terminology like if the people ever quit being a, a religious people or a moral people. But it's the same thing. If people ever quit fearing the Lord, they said there aren't enough laws to restrain sinful human nature. You can't pass enough laws. You can't put enough metal detectors in. You can't do enough to restrain people if they lose the fear of the Lord. And this is the reason that today we see people going into places and shooting people and killing people and stuff because they've lost the fear of the Lord. Used to, I, actually, we had a shooting in Columbine, Colorado, back in 1999, and, uh, and there was this Dylan Klebold and... I forgot the other one's name. But anyway, they went in and killed 13 people and then they killed themselves. And it was a tragedy. And of course, it became front and center, not only in Colorado, but nationwide. And people started talking about gun control and we got to confiscate guns. And I've always said that guns don't kill people any more than forks make you fat. You could take a gun and lay it here for years and it'll never kill anybody until some person picks it up and uses it. But anyway, there was all of this gun control stuff being talked about. And there was a man who wrote in who was old, you know, like 80 or 90 years old. And when he was a kid, he said that every person in his school, they had a one-room schoolhouse, every kid in the school from like from fourth grade on up, carried a gun with them to come to school. They had to have a gun to protect themselves from animals and things. He said every kid in the school had a gun. And they never had a killing. Because they had a fear of God. But you remove the fear of God. Our legislators are standing up and saying, we've got to do something about this gun control. We've got to do something. It's those legislatures that are causing the problem. Because they have systematically been taking away the fear of God and introducing homosexuality and bestiality and transgenderism and pot and all of this kind of stuff. They're coming against every moral foundation that we have. And as they remove this fear of God and remove people from morality, they are the ones that have loosed this evil. We need to have politician control, not gun control. Amen. Praise God. In Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13, it says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth. Froward mouth talks about a lying mouth. And lying, you know, it says in uh, Exodus chapter 20, it says, Thou shalt not bear false witness. A lot of people say, well, I didn't lie, but did you leave a wrong impression? See, there are people like we had just yesterday, we had the March for Life. And there was over 500,000 people that went to Washington, D.C. and marched. And President Trump, the very first president to ever speak in support of March for Life. And praise God. And did you know that the majority of the news networks didn't carry anything about it? Or if they did, they just, I read one and they said thousands of people turned out. Not 500,000, but thousands of people. Did you know that that's false witness? That's breaking one of the...
Ten Commandments. It didn't say you shall not lie. It says you shall not bear false witness. And when you sit there and, and skew things and report only the things that uh, substantiate what you're wanting to get across, that's false witness. And so pride and arrogancy and the evil way and a lying or a deceitful tongue do I hate. It says the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. You can't just tolerate it. You'll hear all these things saying that we need to be tolerant. I was over in Plymouth, England, and uh, we rented a uh, government building there in Plymouth, England to hold a meeting, and uh, the gay and lesbian community came out and picketed me, and they tried to get them to block us because this was a public building, and we were holding a religious meeting, and praise God, the people went ahead and let us hold the meeting, but there was people there picketing and, and uh, fighting against us, and the BBC wanted a interview with me and I turned them down because they'll sit there and twist everything you say. So, But when I got there, they were already there and they stuck a camera right in my face and started saying, you're intolerant. The Bible teaches tolerance. You should be tolerant towards the gay and lesbian and all of this. And they said, what do you say about that? And I said, you're wrong. The Bible doesn't teach tolerance. And it just totally knocked them off of their game. <laughs> They said, what do you mean? It does too. And I said, it does not. It says that you should hate evil. I said, I love the people. I love those people. I'm not against them. I've got friends. I've got people that have struggled with homosexuality and I've never treated them badly. I don't treat anybody badly. But I hate homosexuality. I hate evil. I hate all of these things. And it does not teach tolerance. You know, I think Pastor Dwayne, if I remember correctly, in his message, he used that verse out of the uh, yeah, 22nd chapter of Matthew where they came to Jesus. What are the, what's the great commandment? And he said, love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And then he said, the second is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And people will take that and say, see, you're just supposed to love them. Don't criticize, don't say anything. But if you go back to where that verse was quoted from, that's Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18 that says you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And if you go back to verse 17, verse 17 says you shall not hate your neighbor in your heart, but you shall under any wise uh, rebuke him and not suffer sin upon him. And then it says that's loving your neighbor as yourself. If you don't tell a person the truth, and you do it because I'm just trying to show love. You hate them. You, you love yourself is what it amounts to. You know, I live in, in the mountains and we have these twisty roads. And I was going home one night. And I was, uh, it was on a place, it was a four-lane divided highway. But it was real curvy going through the mountains. And it was foggy. And you couldn't see much further than from here to the back of this auditorium. And uh, anyway, a guy passed me going really fast. And he got just a short way in front of me. And his lights, brake lights came on and his car jerked to the right. And I could tell he hit something. So I slammed on my brakes. And he was in the right lane. There was a horse in the left lane. He had hit it. And it had caved in his windshield. And he was laying there bleeding and stuff. And then I was parked on the shoulder. And I got out trying to help him. And as I was trying to help him, another Suburban came around the corner going about 60 miles an hour and hit this horse. And it launched it in the air about five feet or maybe 10 feet high and probably 20 or 30 feet this way. And the woman who was driving was able to regain control and stop. And I went up to check on her and she had made a bubble in the roof of her car where her head had hit the thing. And she was laying there hurting and I heard other cars coming. It was a dark night, foggy and everything. And I, I went back down around the corner and started jumping out in front of cars that were going 50 and 60 miles an hour. And they couldn't see me until they nearly got on me. And I had to jump off the side of the road. They were nearly hitting me. People were slamming on their brakes. I heard people cuss me. I'm sure they were waving at me with one <laughs> finger. I'm sure people said terrible things. There was probably some women thinking about this crazy man's trying to flag me down on a dark night and he's bound to be a pervert and who knows what they thought about me. But when they got around the corner and saw the wreck, I bet you some of those same people who cursed me thanked me 
And if I would have said, but I don't want to offend anybody. What would these ladies think about some man trying to flag down their car? I don't want to offend them. It might cause them to fear. If I did that, you could, you could say it any way you want to, but I wouldn't have loved those people. If you love a person, you're going to tell them the truth. And this is absolutely a total perversion of what the Lord said when people sit there and shut up and will not speak the truth because they say that I'm supposed to love everybody. Jesus made a whip. And he went into the temple and overturned the money changers, John chapter 2. And then he did it again in Mark chapter 11. He did it at the first and at the end of his ministry and overturned them and beat people with a whip. The one who was love manifest in the flesh. You have to hate evil. It says in Romans chapter uh, 12 and verse 9, it says, Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. And the word abhor means you're supposed to detest this. You need to hate sin. You don't hate the sinner, but you hate sin. And if you truly believe, like I could, I could spend a lot of time on this, but you go to the own LGBTQ website, and they will sit there and tell you that uh, homosexuals have over three times the suicide rate of heterosexuals. They live an average of 20 years less than a heterosexual person. And on and on you could go. Spousal abuse is nearly 3,000 among homosexuals than it is among heterosexuals. And on and on you can go with this. You know, cigarettes take seven years off of an average person's life, is what the statistics say, and yet we put a warning label on cigarettes. This could be hazardous to your health. If we were going to be consistent, if we weren't hypocrites, we ought to put a warning on homosexuality that this is destructive to your life. It's going to take 20 years off of your life. If we put a warning label on cigarettes, is that because we hate all people that smoke? No, but you're just warning them. This is hazardous to your health. Man, I love you if you're trapped in that lifestyle. If you're having those problems, I'm not mad at you, but I love you enough to tell you it's wrong. And it's going to cause all kinds of depression and sorrow and grief and on and on it goes. And I'm going to love you enough to tell you the truth. And if you don't do that, then you don't hate evil. You don't fear the Lord. It's absolutely true. Man, there's so many scriptures. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18. I'm not going to take time to read it, but the end of that, after it lists all of these terrible things that are happening, it says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. That's a quotation from Psalms chapter 14 and Psalms chapter 53. Those Psalms are identical, and that's what Romans chapter 3 is talking about. So if you truly love God, you have to hate evil. And did you know that when you hate, most Christians think, I can't hate anything. I'm supposed to walk in love. Did you know love has to have a hate side to it? If I truly love my wife, and if somebody came up and attacked her, and if I said, look, I love my wife, but oh, I love you, and I just would never do anything, have you, help yourself, beat her up, <laughs> rape her, do anything you want to, because I'm just full of love. That's not love. I guarantee you, if I love my wife, you come against my wife, it is my responsibility. According to Ephesians chapter 5, I am the savior of the body. And I am going to protect my wife. And that's just, that's just love. And if you truly love God, you, hate, you have to hate the evil that is trying to destroy not only this physical kingdom, but the kingdom of God and that is coming against it and all of the evil. And we've got so many Christians today that have just become totally passive. You know, in the last election, they said that it was the evangelical vote that put tr President Trump in office, and everybody has recognized that. And yet there were, amen. And yet there were 25 million born-again evangelical Christians that didn't even vote in the last election. And if you were one of them, shame on you. And somebody's, oh, you shouldn't say that. I'm saying it. Shame on you. 
You don't hate evil. You don't fear God. You've been given a right and a privilege and you aren't using it. And you don't fear God. And you're part of the problem. I love you, you problem. I'm not mad at you, but I'm telling you, it's your fault that the things are going the way that they are and that killings are happening in the school is because Christians aren't being the salt and the light that we are meant to be. And we're fearing men more than we fear God. Amen. Charles Finney said, if America ever fails, the responsibility will lie at the feet of the clergy. And I, I praise God for Pastor Dwayne, Mark and Lisa, Jacob, Hannah. I know that, man, you are hearing the truth and they're being bold and speaking out. But the average pastor today will not stand up and say these things because somebody will say that you're a hate monger. You, you aren't tolerant. Man, I love people. I love them enough to tell them the truth. Amen. And if you aren't doing that, it's our fault. We are the ones that are allowing this nation to go the direction it's going. And we need to get to where we fear God more than we fear people. Amen. And I know God didn't place this message on my heart for all of the people who didn't come. This is not so you could say, oh man, somebody needs to hear this. I'm going to go get this and give to them. I believe the people right here need to hear this. And I'm encouraging you, you need to repent. You need to say, Father, forgive me for buying into the lies and the deception of the world that is making me as if I'm the intolerant one. There's nobody as intolerant as all of the liberals who are sitting here criticizing those who have any morals. I don't scream and yell at them. I don't treat them badly. And yet they'll treat me badly. Man, I've had a lot of things happen. I'm telling you, it is love to tell a person the truth. You don't have the right to reject the truth for them. It's only the truth that's going to set people free. And it's only the truth that they know that sets them free. You have to be bold to speak this. So anyway, I wanted to share this because I think it'll go along with what uh, Pastor Dwayne is teaching on the counterculture. And hopefully this will reinforce some of those things. I'm sure he'll cover many of the same points. But brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, this is not just a message from Pastor Dwayne or Mark and Lisa or... Jacob and Hannah, this is from God that we need to stand up and start being the people that God called us to be. And if you'll do that, people will respect you for it. There'll be people who'll criticize you. You will, be, you will suffer some. But you know what? People will respect you. Man, I could, I could talk for an hour giving you stories about how I've stood up and done things that at the moment might have cost me something, but in the long run, people wound up respecting me and honoring me, and it worked out to my advantage. It is never wrong to be bold and to stand up and speak the truth. People will respect you. I remember even in grade school that there were bullies beating up on other people, and I wasn't a fighter, but I went up to this bully, and I said, stop it. And he said, what are you going to do about it? And I said, well, I don't know, but you've got to stop it. <laughs> And he says, I'll beat you up. And I said, you probably will, but it's still wrong for you to treat this person the wrong way. And did you know that that bully respected me and he became my protector? <laughs> I had the school bully that was on my side that defended me all of the time. You know, when I was in the army, since they took the clock away, I'll end with this. I'm probably over time, but... But uh, anyway, I was in the Army, and uh, I got delayed with my group that I was at Fort Dix, New Jersey. I was supposed to be going through a Jeep driver's course. I was a chaplain's assistant. I had to learn how to drive a Jeep and do all these things. So anyway, I got delayed, and um, so I was waiting to get paid, and there, it was cold in New Jersey in like November, I think it was, 
And we were down in this little stairwell that was only 10 by 10. And there was probably 30 or 40 of us standing down there. And we were all huddled together. We didn't have uh, field jackets or anything. We were just in fatigues and we were cold. We were down there waiting on them to open up and pay us. And so uh, I'd never seen any of these people before. And there was, they were just cursing and doing terrible things. And there was this one guy in particular who was blaspheming God and saying terrible, terrible things. And I was just praying, saying, oh, God, what can I do? Give me something to say. And right as I prayed that, this guy who was blaspheming God, he just stopped. And he says, that's no way for a good old Schofield carrying Baptist to talk. And I mean, it just came out of me. I said, you got a Schofield Bible? And he says, yeah, do you have a Schofield Bible? And I said, yeah, you ought to read yours sometime. <laughs> And he says, what do you mean? I said, have you ever read in Matthew chapter 12 that it says every idle word that men speak, they'll give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by your words you shall be justified and by your words you shall be condemned. And man, he got mad and he started pushing his way through this crowd and he got right up to me. And I said, one other verse, Galatians 4, 16 says, am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? And this guy... He just stopped, and he never said a word. He just turned his back to me, and for the next 20 or 30 minutes, not a single word was said. <laughs> and I was just standing there, and, and it turned out they put me in with that group. <laughs> and did you know, for the next eight weeks, they would, I, they'd be in the barracks, and I'd walk in, people would be talking and doing things. When I came in, everybody, shh, and they'd just shut up. Not one word was said to me for eight weeks. I'd go sit down and there'd be people at the mess hall and I'd sit down and they'd all pick up their trays and leave. And I ate by myself for eight weeks. I didn't have one word spoken to me for eight weeks. So there was some price to that. But did you know that right before our Christmas break, the day that we went on our Christmas leave, this guy came walking around the corner. They would all go to the porn pornography section and look at the Playboy magazines. I'd go sit in the kitty section and read my Bible. And anyway, this guy came walking around the corner and bumped in me and he saw me and he started to go the other way and he stopped and he said, Womack, you don't think I'm a Christian, do you? And I said, I don't know. But I said, if I was a fruit inspector, there's not enough fruit to convict you. I said, I've been praying for you. And he broke down and started crying. And he says, ever since you said that to me, he says, I haven't been able to sleep. He says, I'm a Christian. I was in gospel singing groups. I sang with the Happy Goodmans on platforms. He says, I know better. And he says, would you please pray for me? And the bell rang and we went to class. And I said, well, when we get back from leave, I'll uh, talk to you. And out of our group of about 50 people. He's the only one that got orders while we were gone on Christmas leave and he never came back. The rest of us were shipped to Vietnam and he went to Germany and I didn't see him again. And it was 25 years later, he was in another room and I was on television and he heard my voice and he says, I know that voice. <laughs> and he came running out and he came to one of my meetings and he's now an Assembly of God pastor. It turned his life around. And so it may cost you something, but I'm telling you, people, anybody who has any desire for God at all, they'll respect you for standing up and speaking the truth. You need to have a fear of God and not a fear of man. So, Father, I just speak these things in your name. I believe that the Holy Spirit emboldens us and helps us to where, Father, we will start honoring you and respecting you, trusting you, loving you more than we love people and respect them and want their opinion. Father, we submit ourselves to you and I believe that you use these words to build faith 